Well, praise the Lord. And I know you're all sitting there saying it to yourselves, oh, here we go. He's going to tell us how much he loves Thursdays. But yes, I do, because that's when I get the honor and the privilege to open up the door to all your smiling faces to come in and uh, grab a chair and sit around the Lord's round table as we uh, get the opportunity and the privilege to hear who the Lord has brought to us for this evening. And so for those of you that are calling through the conference line and those of you that are listening, wherever you are on this world, this planet that the Lord has created, my name is Steve and I'm the doorman of the Lord's round table. And again, it is an honor and a privilege for me to hold the door for you so that you can all come in and pull up a chair and we're going to have a good time as we always do Uh, tonight. We got a uh, brother with us, and, and you know, brother, I was thinking earlier, you know, we all, you know, in our jobs, we all have titles, and some are really impressive, you know, like all of you truck drivers, we all know that we're, uh, we're transportation engineers, and, uh, you know, if, uh, if a housewife can be a, a domestic ginger, or engineer and a janitor can be a sanitary engineer, truck drivers can definitely be transportation engineers, but the title that you have is one that definitely makes people take attention. And for those uh, I haven't talked to you yet today, this is our brother Jeff and uh, retired, uh, but he was a special agent uh, in Colorado, DEA for drug enforcement. But you know, as I was thinking about titles, we all have titles. And whether we like titles or not uh, is irregardless. But the most important title that we could possibly have is to have the title of being a child of the living God. And I know our brother that we have here with us this evening has such a title as that. He is a child of the living God. So, brother, with great pleasure and honor, I'm just going to turn the floor over to you. And we're going to just glean off of what the Lord has put on your heart. Well, great, thanks, Steve. I hope I don't lose you. I'm uh, I'm on the highway somewhere in uh, somewhere in Northwest Texas, so I'm hoping that uh, hoping that we hold the cell site. So far, so good. So I'll I'll talk fast. Um, so um, how did I get involved in this? I've been asking myself that for several weeks. Um, I was I was referred to Steve and, uh, by a friend of mine who's a chaplain, who, uh, Bill Fay. Who every time I speak to Bill, I get homework sure we all have that friend that every time they call and you see it's them you think i got to go get a pad before i answer because i'm going to get homework but i i will tell you that uh i'm i'm super excited about this ministry uh, especially over the last few days i've been trying to uh trying to drive from central florida back to denver um and i've gotten to kind of see a little bit of the world that that you people see every day so um pretty impressive stuff so first uh thanks for what you do uh, I um, I wanted to tell a quick a quick supply chain story. Um, I years ago when I was a young cop or a young agent rather in South Florida, we did an exchange program with uh, some cops from the Soviet Union. This was back in the old days when the Soviet Union was the Soviet Union before the wall came down, and we did an exchange program. And a police department, Broward Sheriff's Office, was hosting several uh, Soviet police officers. So we took those officers to uh, uh, to the grocery store to show them our grocery store, and they they commented on how impressed they were that our government would stock our grocery store just just to show them uh, the visit. So we we insisted that all of our grocery stores look like that. They didn't believe us, so so we spent the next few hours driving grocery store to grocery store, and they were blown away. And later that night, we took them out to dinner at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. If you've ever been to Ruth's Chris, it's probably too much beef. It's a lot of beef. And as we were being served and about to eat, we looked up, and one of our guests had tears in his eyes. And uh, I thought, wow, he's really impressed with our tour. He's actually shaken to the point of tears. And he told us later that the amount of meat that had been served just him was more than two weeks of the amount of meat that he and his family of four got in the Soviet Union. And a lot of that comes down to the riches in, in, that we enjoy, and, and that is everything I have was brought to me by you. So thank you for uh, for 
dealing with the highways, dealing with the weather, um, dealing with what you deal with so that I can open my cupboard and have what I need. And I, I, I'm humbled by the fact that I would be asked to speak to people that work that hard. Um, and when I say that, understand I live in Colorado most of the year, and I hate to be cold. So when I drive to the mountains and I see drivers out putting tire chains on and I'm turning up my heat, I think they work harder than I do, and you certainly do. So, so thank you for what you do. So as Steve mentioned, a quick career history of mine, I, I don't know about the title piece, but I had lots of titles. Most of them were way more impressive than I am or was and, and really were uh, great on a business card, but not, you know, not super real. Uh, but I was um, a career law enforcement agent, so I was a, a, a real cop back east. That's what agents call cops, is real cops. Um, I did that for just under five years. And then I ended up I ended up a DEA agent, which was a dream job for me, and partially because I think I wanted a, a mulligan. I wanted an excuse to sin. I basically lied for a living for my first five years. I, I told lies to, uh, uh, to cartel members to try to infiltrate their organizations, which um, I'm still not sure I fully understand what the uh, sin rating was on that on that sin. So, um, but I, it was it was a dream come true job for me. I always loved to act, and it was the ultimate uh, ultimate acting job because you got pretty quick feedback on whether you were any good. So it was it was a great career. So that's my professional career. One of the things that um, that I often thought, and I still think, is Cops are a lot like certain professions. If you think about what cops do, other than um, you trying to avoid them when you're driving cross country, which we all do, uh, is there are a lot of similarities really between what I believe you do, and again, I'm guessing because I've never done that, um, and what I did as a policeman. So I was thinking about th that in the last few days as I was driving. And, and um, for the first thing I thought was, just loneliness, you know, like, you know, cops are lonely. They spend a lot of time alone communicating with others, but really being alone. Sole proprietors off on their own, um, trying to get through the day, make a living and, and, and get home. So there's that, there's the loneliness piece. Um, the windshield time we know can be as liberating as it can be haunting. Um, being away from family, both professions have that. Um, Steve was telling me, how seldom he ever got home, and it basically blew my mind. It really was about the same um, in a year that my son, who was deployed to Iraq for a year, was home with his family. So, um, so I think you had cops' feet in terms of time away from home. Um, you know, you work when others are off, like cops do, which is, is difficult. I sometimes forget that you know when I'm home on Christmas morning enjoying my day, uh, you guys are out here. You 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 guys and girls are out here and. Uh, and the cops are out there. So there are some similarities, but there's also some similarities that are a little difficult to talk about. And one of them is, I think, that presence of evil. If, if, you, if you're like me, you, you know that evil exists. The world that you live in is a world that's away from um, the boundaries of family. It's away from um, the normal life at home, if you have one. And it's being alone on the road with um, with nobody to, to kind of sometimes keep you straight and ask you why you're making decisions. So I think cops and people that, that drive for a living have, have an excellent awareness that Satan is real and that Satan is everywhere we go and that we're basically fighting this battle for good and evil. So I think that, that's, that's probably good that we're aware, but it's also problematic. It says something about the profession. And those professions tend to be very difficult on people um, in terms of temptation, in terms of, you know, the suicide rates are very high. Um, so it's, it's a, it can be a difficult uh, profession that very few people fully understand or really want to understand. Um, one of the things that you probably feel about your profession is that if you haven't done it, you don't understand it and you don't really have a right to, to teach it or discuss it. Um, and I, I had a friend once who told me, he said, you know, teaching what you ain't done is like going back to where you ain't been. And I think cops are that same way. Cops tend to listen only to cops. And my assumption would be, based on your sacrifice and the specialties of your job, that you tend to listen more 
to somebody that's driving beside you or that you that you meet on the road or that you you know has been on the road. So you get that you get that expertise and that experience. And I would just comment before I kind of go into my story that that that's a shared thing among our professions that that we're a little bit cynical. I always said I have the spiritual gift of, of cynicism um, and criticism, but you know I, I just wanted to say that I believe that that's the area for discipleship. That's where we're really can disciple each other best is that, you know, I can, I can try to tell my story to people on the road, but when I sit in a police car with a policeman or I talk to a cop who has lost a friend or uh, who's obviously depressed, I, I've been in that car. Um, so it gives me a license with them that I wouldn't ordinarily have. So for the purposes of this talk, I need you guys to grant me a temporary license because I'm not an expert at what you do. Uh, I, I respect it. Uh, I drive for two days and I need to rest for for 60 days. Um, so bear with me while I while I tell you my story and hope to try to make it relevant to you. And my my prayer is that out there is someone, even if it's just one person somewhere, that what I'm about to say either helps you, encourages you. Um, you yeah, I agree. I've been through that same thing. Um, then I'll know that God took my words and I didn't. So. Um, so let me talk a little bit about my life real quick. Um, Steve told me, take your time. People are on the road. They got nothing but time. But I won't I won't do that to you. I think Steve was setting me up. Um, so um, I will tell you that I had a miraculous faith story. My my The way that I came to salvation was miraculous. So let me tell you a few of the details, and then we'll talk about that, that assumption. So first of all, I grew up in the church. I grew up. Um, uh, a child of very faithful parents. Um, my, my family, my immediate nuclear family, had no divorce. We had no substance abuse. We had no abuse at all. We went to church every week, several times a week. We were Southern Baptists, and there was always something going on, usually revolved around food. Uh, but we, we would sit in the back room of the church while my dad was at choir practice or deacons meetings. So I grew up in the church. I was at Sunday school every week of my life as a kid. That was not by choice. That was a non-negotiable in my house. Um, church is where we went, and it was not negotiable. In fact, my fear of missing Sunday school was so strong that as a teenager, my parents went on ahead to church. I was going to meet them there, and I got locked out of our house. And I got locked out of our house. I had my car key, but not a house key. And I had no shoes on. All I had, I had dress clothes, which we used to have to wear to church, but I had no shoes. So I went to church in socks. And after church, my dad (laughs) saw me and said, where are your shoes? And I said, they're at home. I got locked out. I came to church anyway. He was really impressed with my faithfulness. He didn't realize I was afraid not to go to church. So it was not, it was not uncommon for my brother and I to get attendance awards at church in Sunday school, not because we would have been there, but because it was the expectation of my family to be there. So I was a good kid. I, I, I was raised in a good home. I never got in trouble. I never hurt anyone. And I knew the gospel and I knew the Bible, but I didn't know Christ. So my faith story, when I talk about it's a miraculous story, you're now wondering what's so miraculous about it. So I I have this theory, and maybe it's a calling, that sometimes our desire for drama and excitement can cause us to lose the fact that all salvation stories are miraculous. Anytime someone is saved for eternity by the living God, that is miraculous in and of itself. And so what we tend to do, I think, and I've done this myself, is focus on the story, focus on the person that was saved. So it's not hard to find a sermon online. I've listened to a lot of sermons on the radio in the last few days. It's not hard to find a sermon about a, a, uh, somebody that was in the gangs that became a believer, somebody that was a hit man that became a believer, a full made mafia man became a believer, drug trafficker, uh, somebody that was living a hard life, drug addict. I will tell you, I agree that those are miraculous salvation stories. The tenth myth is, that all salvation stories are, are a miracle. They're, they're amazing. They're God's providence and love for us, and they're, they're basically bought with Christ's blood. So the more I, 
I think about that, the more I think, and, and you've probably thought about that too, we used to ask the question, you know, some would say, I don't believe I'm good enough to be saved. I'm, I'm so dirty. I'm such a sinner. I've done so many things wrong. I've lied. I've cheated. I've stolen. I, I hear that sermon a lot. The sermon I don't hear, and it worries me, is the sermon that talks about the good guy. What about the salvation of the good guy? So let me ask you this question. If I'm a good guy and I do good things and I, I, I'm nice on the highway, which no one is nice on the highway. Um, I, <laughs> if I were that one person, I was nice on the highway. I was neighbors. I helped people. I found out people in my town needed help. Why would I feel like I needed Jesus Christ in my life? If I was a drug addict, I, I might know. I might, I might get to my knees one day and realize I need help. I need something, and I, and I can't do it myself. So I have a heart for a ministry field that is the field of the good guy. And you know you're with a good guy when you hear things like, you know, I went to church grow, growing up. That's my story. I went to church growing up. I know all about the Bible. I know all the stories. Um, I, you know, I've, I've heard all that. I've heard it's great. You know, on, on Christmas and Easter, I'm a CEO, a Christmas and Easter only church goer, or I live a good life. That's the buzzword for me. Hey, I, I'm, a, I'm a nice guy. I live a good life. You know, so and so is dying, but he lived a good life. There's a denial among good people that, that they're sinners and that they're going to be bound for hell. So for me, my story. My story changed in high school when I must confess that I got involved in, if you've ever heard of Young Life, it's a it's organization, Christian organization for high school kids, um, and it actually can, can continue into college in some respects. But I was invited to a meeting, and my first question, like most high school boys, were, which girls go? I got to find out which girls in our high school. We had a massive high school. I went to high school in Bowie, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C. I had a 1,000 kids in my high school graduating class. So there were a lot of girls, a lot of girls I wanted to meet. So I went to Christian organization, Young Life, because certain girls did. So when I went, I wasn't disappointed. It was a very positive environment, just like the churches I had grown up in. Uh, people were saying nice things. Uh, people were being kind to each other. And I got invited to camp in upstate New York. They're not a week. And again, I, I repeated my question. My wife's actually seated next to me driving, so she's hearing all this. I may have to walk soon. Um, but I, I invited to the camp. My first question, who's going? What girls are going? So I found out the cool girls are going, some of the cool guys are going, and I went. So in summary, I went to upstate New York, the Young Life camp, looking for love, and I found it, but not the kind I was looking for. So in five days of camp, uh, my life was transformed. Everything I knew about Jesus, everything I knew about the Bible, everything I knew about what the gospel said became personal. So this kid who grew up a good kid realized for the first time that he wasn't a good person, that what I needed was the gospel. So for me, I had this aha moment. So what made it miraculous? It made it miraculous because I might not have ever known I needed it. Because it's not about being a good person. It's not about being nice. That's great. There's there's a lot of cult members that are nice to people. It's not about that. So ultimately, what what happened in my life during that week was I realized, and this is the advice I give to you if you want it, is that it's not about me. It's not about the person saved, what I did, how bad I was, how good I was. It was about what Christ did, what God did when he sent Christ 